Um, as far as I'm concerned, the closure of the NIMR and the move of the, some of the staff down to the new institute, the Crick, I'm very sad about that. I think the NIMR had the most fantastic culture and ethos, particularly in the early days when we weren't lumbered with having to um, cost everything and prove that everything we were doing was useful to society. It was my whole life at Mill Hill. I worked there for 42 years and obviously I'm very sorry that it's not going to be there anymore. Whether the move to the Crick, it's, I hope very much it succeeds and becomes a world leading research institute. I think that Mill Hill was a world leading research institute. I don't think personally that it needed to be fixed. I've heard the arguments about the reasons for combining it with other organisations and moving it to the centre of London. My feeling is they don't cut a great deal of ice. We tried combining with other organisations when we tried the CRC at Norfolk Park. It didn't really work. Mill Hill has always worked. I don't think being in the centre of London and the advantages that we are told that has our advantages. No one I know who's worked at Mill Hill has ever said to me what a drag it is being out here in this lovely countryside coming to work. I'd rather be in London. I've never heard that. I don't believe in this modern day of, of instant communications by video conferencing, iPhones, heaven knows what, that you need to be sitting next to the person you're collaborating with. So I don't know why it was done. I'm suspicious about what reasons there might have been that I've never heard. A lot of people agree with me that it shouldn't have been done. I think if you've got a world-class place that is providing um, Alpha++ plus plus research, why are you fixing it? One of the pressures on the section when I was running it was the cost of the running of the section and whether it was justified. And how I ran things was I would apply at the beginning of the year for capital items and, and, and small spending money budgets which I would get if I could justify them. I certainly could get the spending money budget probably and how I charged out what we did for people was to say to them to start with how long I thought it would take in terms of how many man hours or how many days work it was and how much I thought the component cost would be, the bits that were going to be used. And at the end of the job, I would charge them for the bits, but I wouldn't charge for the time, because obviously our salaries were paid by the MRC, and therefore that was how it was paid. But, it, but, it, but I would tell them how much it was, in, in theoretically, because I think it's important for someone who's asking for something to know the cost to MRC, and, and therefore the cost to society of what they're asking us to do and sometimes things were really trivial and they weren't justified you know you could say well actually you, you, you think you want this but you know you do you really want it it's a lot of work and actually what's going to come out of it may not be worth it so giving people an idea of the cost in time was important and we used to do this and then I don't remember when it was but Mrs Thatcher was the Prime Minister she had an efficiency run and there was a chap called Baird involved in this. I think he came from Marks and Spencers or something like that and he was in government advising on efficiency in the civil service and the MRC <coughs> which wasn't civil service but is a sort of civil service type of organisation paid for by the government basically, paid for by society and, and I think she wanted to save money. So they came in and they said to us we really ought to be charging out the labour cost as well as the uh, component cost for what we did and, and I think they thought, and they were right, I think, that if we did do that, a lot of people would not ask us to do what we were doing. And I didn't like the idea of that because I could see two things. First, I could see things not getting done that probably would be useful. And secondly, I could see the department folding up because we wouldn't be asked to do anything very much. So I managed to resist that and we ended up compromising and just charging out for the parts. A similar tale at the same time was that we were told that other... Um, organisations like ours had saved a lot of money and why weren't we doing it? And one of the examples we were given was, was Porton Down. Porton Down had saved all this money and uh, why couldn't we do something similar? So um, I went down to Porton Down with John Wills and Megan Davis from head office to see how Porton Down had saved all this money. And I can't remember all the details and I knew we wouldn't 
learn anything that would help her to save money because they were already talking to me and I'm actually quite a tight-fisted guy. I don't waste money if I can avoid it. I never have done. I was brought up just after the war when it was made do and mend. And we got down to Porton Down. And one example I'll give you was that apparently they had some ranges where they would test out various types of ammunition or what, whatever it was. And they had a chap at the end who would be putting up the targets and reporting back as to how successful various things had been. And this happened about once a fortnight. So once a fortnight he would be doing this and the rest of the time he would be having a fag and d doing anything and they got rid of him. You know, and that's fine, I could quite understand that, but as I explained, we'd done all that, we, we, did, we weren't wasting money in that sort of way, we weren't allowed to do that. So the upshot of all that was we didn't, we didn't save very much we, because we couldn't, we'd already saved it.